my name is Hillary Carter. I'm the VP of Research at Linux Foundation. A little bit about myself. I joined uh, the LF in March of this year, so I'm a newbie. This is my first open source summit. Prior to uh, launching Linux Foundation Research, I uh, launched and uh, ran a, a similar think tank called the Blockchain Research Institute, where we created a similar repository of insights on all things blockchain, um, using implementation evidence, uh, writing white papers and case studies, and doing so along industry lines. So that's a model that I have um, been compelled to replicate at the LF because it um, there's a lot of utility in that um, way of, of conducting research and organizing it as we continue to publish projects. So, um, did, Ed, for, did anyone catch uh, my walk, five minute walk on yesterday? So for those of you who were there, I'm sorry, I'm gonna repeat a little bit of what I said yesterday about why we started this initiative and um, what we hope to achieve. So earlier this year, I was approached um, by Jim Zemlin and uh, others from the LF to um, contemplate the idea of creating um, the definitive repository of data and insights specific to the open source paradigm. To tell the story of what open source is and what it isn't, and to take inspiration from some of the incredible uh, body of research that was conducted um, just after 2000 by Kareem Lakani and uh, Eric von Hippel and um, uh, Bankler, Joachim Bankler, and others. Um, but that sort of thought leadership needs an, up, needs an upgrade and an update for the present day environments. Um, and what is fascinating is that uh, open source as a practice for mass collaboration at scale is not really widely known. Um, we as practitioners or those who are on the front lines of this kind of innovation understand what's happening, but beyond our uh, communities, there is not a lot of understanding about what's taking place. And I know that to be true about the blockchain ecosystem as well. So we wanna create a knowledge base and in doing so create a knowledge network and work with our communities to build these valuable resources that we can all share. So that's what we're going about and why the Linux Foundation is suitable for this kind of um, uh, research uh, initiative is that we are on the front lines of open innovation. We are expanding um, into new industries. We are seeing new projects uh, become open sourced. And we are therefore in a unique position to conduct this kind of research. Um, and seeing industries like even this year, agriculture technology uh, and gaming come under the umbrella of the LF is really quite exciting. And these are stories that we really want to tell. Uh, we have unprecedented access to a community of subject matter experts, leading thinkers, senior decision makers at the world's largest technology companies. And that is rare and it's special. And we intend to leverage that to the benefit of the community. We also, as a nonprofit foundation, are able to convene uh, like minds and those, that same type of individual, both very senior decision maker, people from government at times, and our contributor community and do so and create a, a forum for discussion and thought leadership. So we're in a position to do this and to do it well. And um, so we're going to leverage this opportunity. So what is the value that we intend to create? Well, the first thing we want to do is create a knowledge base. I mean, the purpose of research is to create new knowledge. And when we create new knowledge, uh, or when we create, like good research is defined by uh, questions that generate new research and more research and deeper research. So our purpose is to inform what is going on here. And it's very difficult outside our individual uh, technology areas to, under, to have a grasp at the scope of uh, collaboration and the kinds of projects that are being work, worked on. Um, so if we can create an easy way to inform both policymakers, um, decision makers, uh, students, and society at large about what is happening, then that's, that is an achievement. 
We also want to inspire a new generation of contributors, new generation of participants. And in storytelling and in contextualizing why open source matters to solving common problems, we hope that we can bring new participants into our communities and build more diverse communities. We also intend to engage our, our uh, ecosystem. Um, we cannot do this alone, and it provides us opportunities for new conversations, for outreach, and uh, engagement is a big part of the, the plan, and we think the value of research to, to uh, get our communities involved, and there's so many different ways that we can do that. We also hope to attract uh, new organizations to the LF and expand our, our partnerships at every opportunity. Uh, we think what we do is, is special, and this is one way to kind of uh, broaden the um, community through evidence and uh, data. Uh, we also want to position um, the LF as the center of thought leadership on open source. So these are, these are the goals that we hope to accomplish through this program. As I mentioned um, yesterday, the, the f way we're going about doing this is along three sort of uh, buckets of analysis. The first being exploring open source by industry vertical. So um, last week we published uh, uh, our first, one of our first reports of 2021, uh, the jobs report, which is in its eighth year. But it, we've been able to update that new format, new layout, new graphics, um, new, uh, uh, social shareables and so on. And um, for the education vertical, uh, there's a lot more to come because I think this is a, a new and a growing uh, space. As we saw with our open source program office survey, um, the education and academic sector is starting to get engaged in opening open source program offices. Very exciting. Next week, we'll be publishing research, the, f the baseline study on the state of open source in financial services. So next week at Open Source um, Strategy Forum in London, we'll be launching our research that we conducted earlier this year about what's the landscape for financial services companies. We focused on banks, hedge funds, um, and asset managers. And really, like most um, industries, uh, consumption of open source far outweighs contribution. So industry vertical and Secondly, technology horizontal. We will take very specific looks into individual uh, technologies and describe what it is that is uh, taking place, what the opportunities are, what the challenges are. We worked with Hyperledger uh, to conduct a, a brand study, um, which, which, uh, the results of which have been pre-released, Daniela, to members, and will be released um, more broadly to the member, uh, Hyperledger member community in October. That's an example of a kind of technology research piece uh, that we'll do here at the LF. And finally, for those issues that do not fall neatly into industry vertical or technology horizontal, we call these ecosystem-wide um, issues. We'll explore topics like diversity, equity, and inclusion, uh, management and legal issues, climate, um, standards, things that apply quite broadly. and. Um, there is no shortage of content. I think if we have one challenge at Linux Foundation Research, it, it is scope creep and trying to prioritize. I was asked earlier today if, um, you know, if our agenda is written in stone or what shapes the research agenda, and so often we have to pivot by the issue of the day. Um, if there, I mean, how much work have we had to, um, or, or how have our businesses had to align to something like a pandemic? as an example, or the, the uh, executive order issued by the Biden administration on cybersecurity. I mean, that can sometimes change the direction and change the priority of a business model, and research is no different than that. So our models are to come uh, uh, to create research along a set of core uh, research projects in which we'll, we'll focus on issues like cybersecurity, really big uh, topics and priority topics that sometimes take a little bit longer to publish. Uh, and then we have shorter cycle projects um, of the kind we did with Phenos and Hyperledger, projects that you can conduct in maybe four month cycles. Um, a lot of LF projects may come to us and say we have um, 
we have a need for a survey. We want to work with LF Research to um, create insights or d explore a given uh, hypothesis, and we'll be very glad to, to do just that. So project and short form research um, and describes the sort of shorter and smaller, um, more focused projects that we can bring forward faster. And as I had alluded to previously, I believe very strongly that research is a team sport and it is something that we create together. Um, data and good quality data is often challenging to come by. Uh, survey completes are challenging to come by, especially when we need knowledgeable individuals in a given subject matter. Um, not everybody has expertise in enterprise blockchain and being able to evaluate uh, the different tenets of Hyperledger vis-a-vis -vis other crypto platforms. You know, there are some specialized skill sets that we need to leverage. So how we go about uh, collecting data differs by uh, research project. So if you and your organization are in a position to share data on a given issue, if you're able to complete a survey uh, for which you have some expertise, we'll be very um, appreciative. Thank you in, in advance. We will be sharing a lot of surveys. Um, survey fatigue is um, a, a potential risk, but there is no data without um, going out to market and, and fielding a survey. We do have a very good network um, within the Linux Foundation, a large subscriber base to our emails. And when we have canvassed the community at large, we have tended to get very good and reliable sample. It can get tricky when you're looking for something very specific, as in we only want end users or we're studying end user velocity. That's a little bit more challenging. We can't canvas the LF at large because we're going for a very focused uh, data set. Interviews are another way we're looking for contributions. Um, whether you contribute expertise anonymously or can go on record, interviews are very challenging to generate. Um, if you work for a Fortune 500 or a publicly listed company, generally anything that is published is going to have to run through a communications department and can take weeks and sometimes months to approve and it can get a bit sticky. So it's, it's tough. But qualitative interviews are, um, they pr simply provide a richer perspective. It is wonderful when you can uh, gather the insight of a senior person in an organization and get their thought leadership on a given issue. And any time we can accomplish that, I think that's a win for everybody. We ultimately want to create a knowledge that you just can't get online, um, that create something unique that hasn't been published before. And fresh insights on a new issue uh, generally come out of qualitative interviews. And, and there is a certain demographic who will never do a survey. They will not complete a survey. Certain folks, or senior people in particular, they're not going to spend 15 minutes on a survey, but they will potentially uh, share their expertise in an interview. So we have to balance that a dynamic. Um, there are many ways to get involved in designing a research project. So if there's a topic that you know is on our agenda and you'd like to be part of um, influencing the design of the survey or doing a peer review, that is always um, an option and something I would uh, strongly encourage. I think peer review at every level of the research process is important. Um, Co-branding and sponsorship. If your organization is excited about a given topic and wishes to align uh, your message with our research, that is definitely an opportunity that is also available to the community. Um, supporting DEI objectives. What I mean by that is as we go about the process of creating research, we have to keep in mind um, diverse objectives. Do we have enough interviews uh, that comprise a diverse set of thinking? Um, diversity in thought, diversity in all uh, facet, facets. And sometimes we'll need help in finding the right people to achieve DEI objectives in the research process. It's not just the composition of our teams, but it's how our research is composed as well. We're trying very hard to accomplish this in our current DEI research, which will come out um, roughly in December. And authorship. I'm always looking for subject matter experts who would like to take ownership of a research paper and write a project. Uh, I've hired um, a couple so far this year. 
people I have worked with in the past, uh, folks that Jim Zemlin uh, has worked with. And so if you know of someone who wishes to author a research piece, if you um, want to chat about uh, your own interest and how you can get involved, uh, let's do it. I think talent is, uh, it's not always easy to find and open source talent is very specialized. And writing is, is challenging. It, it, I have worked with many skilled practitioners who understand code very well and they understand computing languages very well. But the written report to make something readable and to structure it well is a skill set unto itself. So when we can blend those skills of potentially both sides of the brain, we can come up with something terrific. But it, it can be very challenging. So skilled writers, send them my way. So here's how we go about um, launching a survey. We often will begin with a research plan, a project scope, and um, a mission and vision of a given piece of research. What's the hypothesis? Who is our um, target audience for survey response? Uh, we'll program and we'll test uh, the survey out. We use SurveyMonkey as our survey instrument. We'll typically do a soft launch. And um, when we have our desired sample, which can range depending on the topic, depending on the size of the community, I think a good sample um, in some areas is 200 and, and in other areas it's 1,000. But there is a sort of sweet spot. My colleague Steve Hendrick, who, who does lead our quantitative process, he, he does like to have a sample anywhere ranging between 200 and, and 500 um, completes. We may at times choose to work with a panel provider to get our completes, in which case we're paying um, per complete. We will uh, often go to uh, a, an LF mailing list, a specific mailing list, to try to find qualified respondents. And sometimes we will canvas more broadly. Uh, going out on social media presents its challenges. Surveys are not without um, being gamed and lots of spam, and that is uh, that is always a challenge whenever a survey is, is shared publicly. We use MarketSite as our analytics uh, tool uh, to generate um, our segmentation, our, our charts um, before they go into production. Uh, so rough deliverables that that generate them in, in PowerPoint and Excel and, and PDF, but we will typically recreate those for professional uh, publication. Uh, and design. Uh, we created a number of optional deliverables. I'll describe our core set of deliverables, but you know, if you wanted to create an ebook, for example, with our research team uh, or an in depth white paper, not just a survey, there are many ways we can create a bespoke research program. I want to briefly share a few of the uh, software build materials results. If you were in Kate uh, Stewart and David Wheeler's presentation earlier, this may come as a repeat, but we um, had a survey in the field for several months on software build materials readiness and we'll publish the uh, findings and analysis next month but here's a, a preliminary view. Uh, we wanted to explore um, familiarity and maturity with respect to software build materials by organization, um, what capabilities are needed, uh, some of the benefits, some of the concerns and where do we go from here. Um, what is, you know, what is the response to the executive order? Uh, what's, what's happening in this space as one of our initial research pieces in cybersecurity? Uh, the survey was in the field for three months. We canvassed a worldwide audience. We translated the SBOM survey into six different languages. I believe it was Chinese, Japanese, Korean, uh, French, German, and, um, uh, Spanish or Portuguese, I'm sorry, I can't remember which. Uh, I think it might have been Spanish. Anyhow, uh, we had a decent response for some of our multilingual um, respondent, or, or multilingual uh, respondents. Uh, we were looking for responses um, by technology consumers, end user enterprises, producers, and uh, organizations including academia and uh, uh, standards organizations, IT organizations. And we're targeting a whole cross-section of IT decision makers, um, line of business leaders, and uh, academics, and ideally decision maker level. 
Our screening criteria, I'm going to just jump over that to get to, the, get to some of the results. Um, in terms of familiarity with software bill of materials, there was excellent familiarity among, soft, uh, among SBON innovators, uh, less familiarity with uh, some of those who we described as being laggards. Um, never heard of. Um, uh, there is certainly work to be done in terms of education uh, around this particular tool um, and its purpose. Uh, in terms of production plans, uh, those organizations who are uh, producing SBOMs uh, across all se segments of the business, again, um, the innovators or, or uh, SBOM early crowd are, are leading that um, uh, sort of readiness element. Um, there is work to be done, though, in terms of um, the urgency of getting organizations to comply. And as I was saying earlier, um, cybersecurity can be a very challenging um, imperative when it's not linked to either business models or, or revenues, and that often crises create change. And so an executive order doesn't necessarily create the change um, as quickly as we might have liked. Where and when will SBOMs be produced? Um, mostly at the production level and um, either during software delivery or um, software builds. Um, again, there's still people who just don't know, uh, but they, they were familiar enough with software bill of materials, but they just didn't know certain, uh, have, have certainty about how to answer specific questions. A production formats, XPDX, uh, SPDX, is a leading known format, and that might be because we canvassed a large number of people within the Linux Foundation community who were uh, familiar with SPDX because of its LF um, origins and, uh, and team, LF team members associated with the origins of SPDX. But certainly other tools like Cyclone DX um, are, are fairly well established. I'm going to move on in the interest of time. Uh, we'll, we'll publish more uh, details on, uh, on the SBOM readiness survey in October. Yeah. So, um, how, much, how much did you see people with, with familiarity for Cyclone DX versus SPDX? Uh, like, can you comment at all about like the, obviously each one is bigger in different communities, but Not specific to Cyclone, or, oh, sorry, repeat the question. Yeah, can we comment on uh, the uh, familiarity of, of Cyclone uh, DX versus SPDX? We, at this point, I cannot, so I'm not, I'm not able to answer that question with any kind of accuracy, so I'll hesitate in doing so. Uh, but it, you know, if we were to look at, at different tools and who responded, that's, that um, could be a study unto itself. Thank you. Good question. Uh, so, what is on the agenda, and what does our what do our research deliverables look like? So, this is what is coming down the pipeline. SBOM readiness is coming out next month um, for Linux Foundation Platinum and Gold members. We have um, a an exclusive set of research that is specific to policy insights in both the United States and the European Union what um, senior leaders in government, legislators, chiefs of staff, and um, senior members of government departments are thinking about technology issues. How do they see uh, tech priorities? What are their uh, constituents concerned about? Um, what's on their agenda? And what was very interesting was that uh, Republicans and Democrats, for example, in, um, when looking at cyber, view cyber very differently. And, and there's a strong link in the U.S. Uh, policymaker environment to connect, you know, cyber priorities with the electrical grid, of all things. They don't typically view cyber in the same lens that we might. Um, we think about cyber in terms of build environments and patches and supply chains. And I think policymakers view technology issues in terms of what is going to upset my constituency 
and am I going to get reelected? And when the grid goes down, I think constituents get mad fast. And, and that has a funny way of playing it into sentiment in levels of government. Uh, so apologies if you're not an LF Gold or Platinum member, this particular research will not be available to you, but we do have um, a, a whole lot of content that will be publicly available. Our um, Open Source Program Office survey results were published uh, just on Monday by the To Do Group. We are also conducting a supplementary research paper on um, the OSPO in terms of the OSPO evolution and, and OSPO archetypes. That's going to come out in November. What's nice about doing a research report following the publication of a survey is that our interviewees who contribute qualitative analysis to research can comment on the findings of, of the survey. And then you put everything together and say, you know, this really is the state of the OSPO in 2021. Uh, Finos is publishing um, uh, their research on state of financial services next week. Uh, Hyperledger will be presenting its findings to Hyperledger members. Soda Foundation at KubeCon, they're going to present uh, storage and data trends in 2021. Our DEI research is coming out in December and um, uh, an updated report on uh, with in collaboration with the Laboratory of Innovation Science at Harvard, um, measuring deployment of free and open source software in private and public companies will come out uh, later this year as well. So here's how we go about um, uh, publishing our, our research uh, initiatives and the core deliverables that you'll expect to see. Typically, we announce a research project. We'll write a blog about it. We will um, create social media posts, especially where there's a survey and we're looking for um, uh, public respondents. Uh, we'll often mention a project in our newsletter and we'll publish the opportunity on linux.com. And here's what our, our blog announcement looked like for uh, the Hyperledger brand survey, which, uh, boy, I think we did that in, in May. In May we published that, yeah. Time flies. So creating, depending on the project, we want to create widespread awareness of um, a, a given piece of research to try to engage the community in the process. Um, our deliverables will comprise an in-depth research report. So next week, um, you'll see the inside contents of State of Open Source and Financial Services. We did this partnership in, in um, collaboration with, with Finos and um, member organizations, including Scott Logic, WePro, and uh, GitHub. So we had a whole committee come together to help design the survey, um, uh, create a set of priorities and questions for um, qualitative interviews and come together and, and put together, you know, a unique uh, perspective and, and some, some uh, impressive thought leadership from a, a, a group of experts that I think this will provide some value. It also creates a baseline for where the financial services industry is in open source against which we can compare um, changes over time. So that's the objective of this research. All of our reports comprise um, a foreword by a subject matter expert in this case. The foreword written by Gabriele Colombro who's joined us um, here today. <laughs> Thank you Gab for writing the foreword. Um, an executive summary for uh, people who are consuming research on the go. Sometimes it's not possible to read an 80 page document but the executive summaries are certainly quite handy. And that's something that typically um, differentiates our reports from some other types of research. Uh, analysis, we want each project to have some actionable conclusions and to stimulate ideation, strategy formation, and next steps um, because we do think that our work needs to be purpose-driven and to have um, thoughts about, what, okay, now what? You know, it's no point in having survey says, what does this all mean and what can we do next? Uh, we are publishing most projects under Creative Commons license and um, we'll have citation information uh, for all of those reports that are publicly available and you want to include them in essays, media, etc. What I love about research is it's a tangible utility. Um, we'll produce PDFs, print them off, read them on the plane and um, they live forever. Our deliverables often include uh, a presentation of survey findings. We'll produce a PDF of our survey, uh, survey results. This is an example of the design work that the LF is doing. 
Um, and this page is simply a summary of the demographics of our, our Phenos research. Infographics. Um, these are terrific uh, cross-utility deliverables that help broadly disseminate the ideas and the findings of a given research project. So these tiles can be repurposed. They can be put into slides. They can be shared as uh, content on social channels. They're colorful. They help visual learners uh, consume the content quickly. Um, so we're quite pleased this was, the, uh, this was a, an idea um, and a styling that uh, was initiated by Derek Weeks, the new CMO who's just joined uh, Linux Foundation. Um, here is a highlight of just how pretty one of those infographics looks in a PDF. So in the OSPO survey, 51% said increase in funding for open source initiatives is somewhat or very likely this year, or very or somewhat likely this year. And it's just a talking point uh, around which other um, uh, initiatives can, can kick off. But I think they, they do serve a purpose to share um, high-level findings quickly and in a highly consumable way. From the jobs report, two-thirds of developers need more training to do their jobs. Good stats, you know. Um, no shortage of, of calls to action come through these. And sorry about this, this is hot off the press. Again, it relates to uh, our financial services report. I don't yet have a, have a production-ready version of this tile, but um, a data point, 15% of employees in financial services are unclear of their FOSS contribution policies. Gets you thinking. We also are committed to providing uh, links to open data sets so that if you want to tinker around with the data, um, if you want to see if you can come up with insights, certainly in our, our SBOM research, for example, and what what a given population thinks if they happen to choose Cyclone versus um, SPDX, what can you find? And those data sets uh, will be published on data.world. We'll remove all personally identifiable information and you're free to pull the, the um, either the Excel spreadsheet or the CSV files um, and use them as you see fit. Oh, I should say they'll also be under a CDLA a permissive 2.0 license. So our agenda, um, insights in the EU, yeah, I, I explained that briefly about ballast research. This is the research that is for gold and platinum members only on um, uh, policy sentiments uh, around technology. So we'll send out a newsletter and get a sense of what different political parties think on given issues. And really why we're doing this is if there is some dangerous piece of legislation that is whispering about the corridors of the halls of power in either Europe or the United States, it might be great for us to know about that ahead of time. And if anybody is on a tear, um, we'd love to have a conversation with that legislator who might be upset or um, uh, concerned about an issue. And we have this opportunity for a conversation before things become a potentially um, difficult for uh, our, our sector and uh, our methodologies. We are very committed to understanding the economics of open source and the value of open source, especially when organizations move from proprietary to open. So what are the value economics? Um, and how do we measure the economics of open source. Sometimes it's in, intrinsic, but other times it has real material dollar value. As I was saying earlier um, to uh, Daniela, we were describing the value of um, open solutions that connect business models and actually help achieve ROI. Um, though it, it's actually hard to find, but we, we want to try to better understand the levers around uh, economic value when, when technologies are open how business um, success metrics change, and um, how do markets, how are new markets created by this decision? Securing software supply chains, or should I say hardening the software supply chain, this is a top priority at Linux Foundation this year. And again, I think a lot of this priority will come down to understanding the economics of risk, the economics of cyber risk, the cost of inaction or the cost of a breach. I 
saw a few years ago the financial services sector move quite quickly on climate issues because of economics. Um, the economics of insurance claims uh, led to collaboration by a number of financial services organizations, um, an initiative called the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures. As insurance claims were mounting and climate uh, risk and climate um, damages were escalating um, at, like exponentially over decades, it, the insurance or companies and certainly pension funds were starting to get a little bit nervous that they needed better data to understand climate risk and how it relates to market risk and potential legal action by unit holders. Unit holders in Australia were suing their pension funds because they weren't doing enough due diligence about the holdings within the funds themselves. How much um, climate risk was exposed to these individual holdings within a portfolio? Were these organizations on the, the path of hurricanes? Were they in flood risk zones? Were they in uh, areas that are at risk of forest fire? What other kinds of climate risk? Are they, are they carbon generators? What's that carbon picture and how does that impact economics? So if we bring that argument forward to security, we might be able to inspire our laggards in um, cyber to, as David Wheeler says, eat their vegetables. How do you, con how do you convince people to eat their vegetables? Oh, sometimes it takes a health crisis for change and we don't want a health crisis when it comes to supply chains. Um, and in terms of other projects that we'll, we'll focus on, this is what's coming down the industry vertical, tech horizontal, and ecosystem pipeline. I shall say, because we're still very much um, in a pandemic, uh, that public health issues and looking at the adoption challenges of com some COVID tools, I think is a very interesting area of study. Uh, we have technologies that are incredibly powerful, but, but there is a fear of tech and there is a distrust or a mistrust of technologies. We have an application in Canada that was developed by the team at Shopify, it was donated to the government of Canada, rolled out um, to all Canadians, but the download rate um, was not um, effective, shall I say. That same tool was then donated to be hosted at the Linux Foundation should other societies, governments um, in countries where they just didn't have the opportunity to code up a COVID notification app. Uh, it's there for, for access. It's there for the world. Um, why was there better adoption of a technology like GreenShield in Ireland and the UK? What's going on in our different regions and why is, why is adoption of some tools uh, better than others? Entertainment is such an exciting industry vertical to think that the Academy Software Foundation is coming together and all the film studios are collaborating and then competing on the creative side. But let's, let's work on common problems where we share common costs. Um, automotive and mobility, very important um, industry vertical. We need to uh, have more software definition in these uh, areas and move on from combustion and try to leverage some digital technologies in the process. And climate risk and reporting, this is a passion project of mine. In the tech horizontal area, 3D printing and open standards, I think is a fascinating area. I'm, I am um, mesmerized by what, is, what the capabilities are with 3D printing and how it's converging with other technologies like blockchain, um, where the, the asset that's transferred on a blockchain network, or yeah, on a blockchain network that's specific to 3D printing is the computer-aided design file itself. Much like I would send a crypto asset from my wallet to your wallet, I will securely set, share my computer-aided design file uh, as I um, pitch for the design of a given um, aircraft part, for example. And that provenance is, is secured, um, the, the, um, uh, when, when there's a recall, ah, recalls are better managed. Uh, we know who, which designers are creating um, very effective parts, like fascinating stuff. Um, and since we're in space on Mars and, it, and the International Space Station, it's really handy when you can 
um, print a, a much needed part uh, on site. Um, Linux kernel at 30, that's just a fascinating story. What's the velocity? Um, what do our, what, what does our community want to know about uh, the widespread ado ab adoption of Linux in these areas, these exciting areas? As uh, Chris DeBona said, the interplanetary operating system where Linux is operating on Earth, in orbit, and on other planets. That's a compelling and very inspiring story. And in truth, before I joined this organization, I had no idea that that's how Linux was um, impacting the digital economy and SpaceX and, and you know everything automotive. This is news to me, and I have been in, the, in tech for quite some time, though not in operating system, not in uh, Linux at all. So fascinating. Uh, we do want to explore blockchain technology for all of its um, exciting opportunities. And this is a tech which suffers from misinformation, confusion with crypto, regulatory um, complexities, uh, and sometimes needless ones. When you're talking about um, supply chain applications or vaccine traceability or food traceability, um, maybe there's some applications in cybersecurity where hashing the identity of a developer who has certified the security of a packet um, could be realized. We don't know. This is, we're, we're going to investigate. Looking at software-defined industry transformation, if other, or if other industries follow the model that telecom fo followed, um, or its path to uh, becoming software-defined, uh, then we have an opportunity to potentially reach our climate targets. So some, that's just a snapshot of the art of the possible. Could this change slightly? Yes, but this is what I'm proposing to uh, the Linux Foundation Research Advisory Board tomorrow, which gathers here in the morning. In terms of ecosystem projects, supercoders. Jim Zemlin is very excited um, to explore this topic. Who are our maintainers and what is going on in their worlds? Are they stressed out? Are they overwhelmed? Uh, who are they? Uh, what, what projects are they working on? Uh, is it possible that we have a tremendous burden on too few people and how do we remedy that? So getting a sense of what our uh, maintainer community looks like at the highest levels, I think will be insightful. Um, Moving from inner source to open source, yeah, like how do we, uh, is this a, a method for, for change and how do we leverage inner source activity um, and encourage that um, or what are the trends? How have organizations gone from inner source to open source? What can we learn? Mentorship, uh, Shua Khan came to me and said, we'd like to know more about the value of our mentorship program. So let's have a conversation, a survey, Let's find out what the economic value is of mentorship programs. How well are we doing? So we're, we'll, we'll be working with you on that project. Same thing with salaries on certifications. You've taken a cert. How has it changed your life? What are the economics of that? Um, was it, you know, is, is that um, useful data for organizations to um, consider certifying at the larger scale? That is a question. Yes. Um, is, the, is the intention to focus that around just coding as the type of contribution of coding, and so whatever you would, however you would measure that, or is it actually, because you then said maintainers, so is that really super contributors? Yeah, it's probably super maintainers. Yeah, I mean, we'll see. I, I, I'm, in truth, I'm still learning uh, what the scope of that project could be, yeah. and say, what are the, where, what are the issues? Um, and so part of the research development process, uh, uh, process is to have conversations say who who and what should we be focusing on what questions should we be asking yeah um yeah so that is what we plan to bring forward in 2022 hoping to publish um, core research at least one uh, every six months and uh, uh, four projects a quarter now uh, as our resources maybe make um, be maxed out. We, our team could expand to address uh, demand. We may find we have to reprioritize depending on a given project coming to us and say, would you mind swapping this one out with that one? Um, 
but it, these are all conversations that are you know not set in stone but this is just a, a snapshot of what we can and would like to do at this point in time and I am now available for your questions that brings me to the end of my presentation thank you very much for your attention Yes. Yeah, in fact, the 3D printing project, there are standards being created around that, open standards in 3D printing. There are open standards in, um, there are standards groups uh, for in blockchain, for example, creating standards on um, uh, transport, like a standardized way to do a bill of lading that could be industry-wide, something like a, it was led, the initiative was led, um, or influenced by, uh, Oh my goodness, head of Enterprise Ethereum Alliance, Daniela, former head, Ron Resnick, who did the uh, work on SIM cards and standardizing SIMs for the telecom industry. So there's a lot to explore there, and it really is important um, because standards are, are, you know, they create value. Who's the one with the LFT visual identity? Ah, visual identity? Oh, sorry, uh, yes, yeah, thank you. Digital identity at uh, Linux Foundation Public Health. Um, trust, over trust over IP standards um, in financial services, not within the LF, but uh, but an identity an identity standard that's being used uh, within the Canadian financial services sector is was um, led by SecureKey, an LF member organization, uh, where the big Canadian banks collaborated around know your client standards so that if my identity was verified at RBC Royal Bank when I went to apply for a mortgage and then I wanted a credit card at um, Bank of Montreal, one bank's uh, validation and certification of my identity is accepted by all. So that's a massive cost savings. So yeah, I love the idea of standards and collaboration around standards. Yes. Yeah. And so it, it, I'm unclear, like, bringing the inner source back to open source, if inner source was already taking open source stuff. I, I think you're just talking about companies moving towards more open source. Stuff. Exactly, yes. How inner source. Yeah. Um, to, to, yeah, I'll try to clarify the question with the answer in that the research project that was proposed on um, inner source as a path to open source is really about how an organization evolves its, its participation in open source more broadly outside of the walls of its organization. And the first thing an organization can do is participate in a sort of inner source um, collaboration on technologies that will only be used by their organization. And then once they get the, the idea of how bringing different parts of an organization together to work on a common problem. I think, well, what if we move outside of our organization walls and contribute outside of just our organization? How is that an, almost an essential step in creating the culture that's necessary for, for open source? And if you, can't, if you can't get inner source, it could be that you can't get open source either. Well, I think, are we at time? I think I'll wrap it. Thank you very much. I, I'd invite you all to ask questions, get in touch with me on email, on Slack, LinkedIn, whatever. I'd be delighted to talk to you about research anytime. Thank you so much.